Hello all and welcome back to the Ascent Cycling Podcast for yet another team preview ahead of the 2021 cycling season and as the season is now well and truly on its way uh, we are carrying on with our World Tour teams with today the team of the world champion De Quick Quickstep an interesting 2020 season for them 39 wins uh, 15 before lockdown um, but unlike some of the previous seasons, maybe not the maiden uh, big win that you're usually seeing with the Canuck. Granted, they did win the World Championships uh, through Julien Philippe. Joe, what did you make of their 2020 season? As always, they rack up the wins. I think I'm right in saying they've won the most wins every single season in the last decade. So the dominant team in the sport, it has to be said. But... Although they did get the most wins in 2020, I don't think it was their best season. Um, they did get three uh, stage wins at the Tour de France. But looking at their win total, 39 wins in all, only 11 of those wins came in World Tour. So not the greatest of seasons for De Koenig. And they didn't win a monument either. Um, although they were right there in the final in Liège, as we know, all too well. They were right there in the final at Milano San Remo too. And they would have been there at the Tour of Flanders too. So they missed out on a few big wins for sure, but racking up the wins in some of the smaller races. I think probably the best result for one of their riders was Julian Alaphilippe's World Championship ride, but obviously not part of Quick Step in that, in that race. It seems that there has been a, a recent focus on Grand Tours for the Belgian established team. Um, with mainly Joao Almeida um, being the Malia Rosa on the Giro d'Italia doing very well um, and surprising a lot of people. Um, Julien Lafilippe, we have seen him wearing the yellow jersey of the Tour de France um, for quite a while, two seasons ago. Uh, he keeps on saying he's not going for the GC, but you never know. It's Julien Lafilippe, he can do many things. And obviously we've got Remco Evenepoel, um, who's still extremely young uh, and seems that uh, the GC could be something he'll be aiming for. So quite interesting to see uh, this change of uh, focus from One Day Classics, which was the trademark of the Canonk for the last well, decade, as you mentioned, uh, to maybe a bit more of a, of a GC kind of team. Yeah, for sure. I think definitely with the emergence of Remco in particular, uh, they've had to kind of focus around the Grand Tours really to allow him a place in the team where he can compete four Grand Tours. I mean, let's be real, this man, if he's able to get back to his pre Lombardia crash form, he could probably win a Grand Tour without a single teammate. This man is unreal. But they're trying to build, I guess, a Grand Tour squad around him and clearly doing that very well because Joao Almeida proved to be a, a particularly strong rider who's much more than a domestique at the Giro last season. So they're trying to shift the focus, I, I, I think, among the classics, and the Grand Tours now, whereas before, they were probably pretty much only focused around the classics. And with this new recent focus on uh, the Grand Tours, we'll see how it affected that transfer window. Two riders outgoing and two riders incoming. Former world champion Mark Cavendish goes back to what used to be Omega Pharma Quickstep when he was there. Uh, for probably his final year, uh, or at least one of his final seasons um, in the world of pro cycling, 30-time stage winner on the Tour de France. It just feels good to see Mark Evenich back um, as, well, in a team that actually knows how to win. He's been joined by Josef Cerny, the um, Czech rider from, uh, from CCC, and outgoing are Sean Quinn from Hagen's Berman Axion. He, I think he joined them as a, maybe as a new pro for like three months. Um, I don't think he's done anything um, with the Conan last season. And uh, the departure of Luxembourg rider Bob Jungels going to Age de Zer Citroën. Um, so not exactly the signings you'd expect from a team that maybe switched their focus recently to a... To a a bit more of a Grand Tour team, but seeing that 2020 window, which was packed with like 12 riders, uh, I think having some stability might be a, a decent thing for the Kunk. Definitely. They signed a lot of riders last season. As you said, uh, Mary Van Savenen came in. Obviously, we have Baggioli, Joao Almeida, um, also Cataneo, Masnado, all riders who can ride the mountains very capably. So... I do believe it's it's good for them to try and keep some stabilisation in the team. And also, 
This team is kind of renowned for offering short-term contracts and almost not quite the salary riders could earn elsewhere. So I almost think it's a success, really, to just keep all their leaders in the team every season. Um, I know Bob Youngles has gone. He didn't win a race in 2020, unless I'm mistaken. So I think Bob Youngles, really, for this team, he's not a leader. He was more of a domestique. At ag 2 he can be more of a leader for sure, but... I don't think they're really going to miss Bob Youngles like you would expect. I know he won Liège a few years ago. A great option to have in the team, but I don't think they're really going to miss Bob Youngles as much as his absence uh, would be missed in other teams. So I, I think it's a pretty good transfer window for them, just keeping it quiet, keeping all their young talents in the team as well um, and nurturing them further to grow this season. And obviously, it's fantastic to see the, the Max Missile back at Quick Step. It really is. It really is. And one thing um, regarding the window from last season, uh, they did get Masnada, but I think he joined them in August. So he basically acts as a, in my opinion, as a new transfer. He did make his uh, Dukanong debut on the Giro, um, but he could be considered as a, um, as a 2021 signing. So we don't talk about quick step without talking about Julian Alaphilippe, the current world champion, 28 years old, of course, from France. He's won five stages at the Tour de France in his career. For me, easily the best puncher in the world right now and has been for a long time too. And he's got an interesting schedule coming up this season. He had an up and down year, I'd say, last season. I mean, world champion, a stage at the Tour, you can't go wrong there. But obviously he had the blunder at Liège at the finish where he celebrated early after swerving across and taking out Hershey and Pogaccia from the sprint and then he had the crash at the Tour of Flanders where he could have competed for the win and almost definitely would have got a podium I believe at the race so coming into 2021 Alaphilippe I think is going to ride again the Cobble Classics I think he's going to ride on loop and he also has the Ronda on his schedule I don't think he's going to ride Roubaix um, but on loop and Ronda it's going to be very intriguing for me to see how Alaphilippe does on the cobbles, because I think he's a real favourite for those races. Indeed he is. Um, obviously, he's the first um, world champion for France in, I believe, 20 years. So it feels weird just to say that there's a French champion, and um, sorry, a French rider as a world champion, but what a rider, what a rider. He's won stages on the Tour de France last year. Uh, he's won, I think, La Flèche Brabanson or Brabant Sepile as well the last season. Uh, and you said he could have done probably a, a podium de ronde. I still back it. It was a very interesting day, that, to be fair, because I didn't think he'd have it in the legs. Um, but seeing him alongside Van der Poel and Van Aert on the ronde was somewhat surprising, somewhat of a surprise for me. But now that he's shown that he can do it, I definitely have him as one of the favorites, if not the main favorite for the Ronde. And what I do like about Julien, and it's no disrespect towards someone like potentially like Mats Pedersen, but as the world champion, he really tries to show his jersey. We've seen early on this season on the Tour de la Provence, he's attacked in the first stage with like 100 kilometers left. Uh, he had a stupendous climb on the Mont Ventoux, um, losing to what, Ivan Souza and Egan Bernal, but he really shows his jersey, and I think it's great for the sport. Um, I mean, he's more capable than uh, than Matt Pedersen, but I don't know, I just really like his mentality. He's always um, always on the attack. He never really settles, and uh, I think that's probably one of the main reasons as to why he's won that much, and I think that's also why many people like Julian Lafayette. He's a very likable person. Uh, now, he's now 28, I think, uh, there'll be one question that we can ask from him. Obviously, we've had a debate with Thibaut Pinot uh, regarding a French Grand Tour winner. Does Julien have it in the legs? I honestly wouldn't know. Um, again, he said countless times he's not going for the GC of the Tour de France. Um, but when you see his early Tour de la Provence, he looks in very decent shape in the mountain. Uh, when you come back to the 2019 Tour de France, where he lost the jersey at like stage 19, I think, uh, he looked capable, so it's a uh, it's an interesting rider. I don't really know what to what to make of his um of his possibilities or hopes uh, when it comes to a three-week race. I think 
Correct me if I'm I'm wrong, Guillaume. I think the word you use in France is panache. This man has flamboyancy, flair, and panache just in abundance. He is he is so fun to watch, and he lights up every race he enters. Like you said, the Tour de la Provence. He made every stage great to watch and he added to every single stage. Even if it, it seemed a, a straightforward sprinter stage on paper, he was there at the front showing his jersey, adding to his team. And that's why it's so great to have him as the current world champion for me. He's, he's great for the sport as a whole and yeah, very, very likeable indeed. So looking at his season coming up, I think we can expect to see more of the same. Challenging in the likes of Strada, Milan San Remo, Ronda again. The Ardennes Classics, I'm sure he'll be there, of course. And then he's going to the Tour de France yet again. And like he said, he is claiming he's not going for the yellow jersey. I'm not sure whether I believe that, to be honest. He's won five stages at the Tour, and it was it was 2019, I think, where he came close to winning the Tour de France before cracking in the final few mountain stages. And you mentioned Thibaut Pinot. Who do you think has the better chance of winning a Grand Tour? Julian Alaphilippe or Thibaut Pinot? Can be any Grand Tour. Who would you rather, if you had to stick on the line, one of those riders for you to win a Grand Tour? Oh, that's a tough one. I have to go Thibaut. Thibaut is more gifted when it comes to the mountains. Yeah, no, um, I, I will still back Thibaut. Um, the thing is, regarding uh, what you said about um, him not publicly saying he's going for a Grand Tour, I think it has to come from the fact that if... He says he's going for a GC and then, uh, well, isn't able to do so. I think mentally it takes a toll on you, uh, which is what we've mentioned with Thibaut on the FDG podcast. Um, and when you just said you're going there as a free rider, as a free element, you're going there for for the for like the stages and everything. You can't really be disappointed. Um, well, at least not as much as you would be if you had the the pressure of the media saying you said you wanted to do well and you finished twenty seventh. What happened? Yeah, no, I do agree with you. I, The thing is, is Alaphilippe is French. He goes to the Tour de France. He's ridden one Grand Tour outside the Tour, which was the Vuelta in 2017. If Julian Alaphilippe was on the start line at the Giro or at the Vuelta saying he's going all in for GC, I truly believe he could definitely win one of those races. The Tour de France, I'm not quite sure the GC suits him quite as much. I think Pogaccio and Roglic... Just will be too strong for him. Uh, too strong for him over the three weeks in France. That's that's my take, really. But Alaphilippe, does he want to give up the Tour de France to try and focus on the Giro or the Vuelta GC? No, he'd rather go to the Tour, ride it, win a few stages, compete in the GC if he's able to, um, and yeah, don the World Champions jersey in his in his homeland. It's I completely agree. I think. Even for a French rider, winning on the Tour de France, as, or like winning a stage on the Tour de France, has more. Um, how can I say? Uh, it's rewarding to win a stage on the Tour de France if you're French than finishing. I don't know on the podium of the Giro, for example. I mean, it's the, it's it's the Tour de France. It's your home race, and Julien wearing the World Champion jersey. Hopefully, if there is some uh, a lot of fans along the road. I mean, right now we still don't know, but I think the. The, the whole climate on the Tour de France really suits someone like Julien, which I think if he was to go for a GC, he could only go for the Tour de France. You said that he probably could win the Giro de Vuelta. actually don't see him doing well on the Grand Tour that is in the Tour de France. I think the whole ambience, the whole environment and atmosphere around the Tour is what makes him capable of doing well. You're the Dequinic... The DS, do you go into the Tour telling Julien to try and go for, G- for GC? Or are you saying... It's, it's out of reach. Let's try and win as many stages. KOM jersey, maybe points jersey, um, and, and just try and, and ride it that way. Uh, well, he's already won the um, the Polka one, I think. Uh, points jersey, I don't think it's doable when you've got someone like Sam Bennett. Uh, and I can't remember exactly the parkour of the Tour this year, but I'm pretty sure on stage two is the Mur de Bretagne, um, which could potentially suit Julien very well. I mean, it's it's literally a hill. Uh, with high, uh, or very steep percentages, uh, very steep slope. So I think Julien on day two could potentially have the jersey. If Julien has the yellow by stage two, I think he could potentially try to keep it on stage five. Um, that's if he wishes to, because it's like a 27 kilometer time trial. And he surprised all of us on the Tour de France 2019 when he was wearing the yellow jersey by winning the time trial. Uh, this one is going to be extremely flat. So 
I think if he enters the Alps as the yellow jersey with like I don't know forty five second lead on his uh, on the uh, the rest of the contenders, then I don't see why he would not go to try and defend his jersey. If he doesn't manage to do so, then then fair enough. Then he doesn't have the legs to go for the GC. He'll lose like thirty minutes on the second stages in the Alp, and then he'll go for the stages in the Pyrenees. That's how I see it. But I think as long as he is within the reach of the yellow jersey, he, why not go for it? I mean, it's it's the Tour de France. You don't get to race that race every year. Well, no, you do actually one time of the year. Uh, but like, why not going for the GC? If you think you can, then go have have your fun. I think if we recorded that this podcast a week ago, I would be saying he needs to focus on stages. But after seeing him on Vontu to Chalet Reynards at the Tour de la Provence, I was really impressed with Alaphilippe's climbing legs. He beats he beat Vlasov, Wout Pools, he beat he beat so many strong riders and only beats them by the two Colombians, Bernal and Sosa. Alaphilippe looked great. He looked fantastic. He really did. I was I was shocked by his performance on Vontu. So I'd love to see it. Let's be honest. It would be a shock if he doesn't have yellow after the second stage of the tour this year. And I'd love to see him go for the GC. But of course, his season isn't entirely based around the Tour de France. He is a big favourite for many of the monuments. And he's only won one monument in his career so far. He's come close at Liège, which probably on paper suits him the best. He's obviously now come close at the Tour of Flanders as well. He's also finished second at Il Lombardia. So... I think for me, one of Alaphilippe's major goals this season will be to add a uh, a second monument to his Palmares. Mm, I think he can add two this year. I think he's he could most likely add Rondo and Liège this season, I think. He could do. He'll be a favourite for sure. But the likes of Van Aert, Van Der Poel at the Tour of Flanders, it's, it's going to be a fun season for, sh- for sure in the monuments. Moving on to another rider from uh, De Conanc after this long focus on Julien Alaphilippe. We're going to stick to a rider that performed very well on the Tour de France, bagging, I believe, uh, two stage wins? Or was it three? It was. I think it was two stage wins, including the Champs-Élysées. Sam Bennett, winner of the points classification on the 2020 Tour de France, uh, stopping the hegemony from Pete Sagan, who's won, I think, seven um, out of nine now um, in the last nine years. Um, I didn't really expect Sam Bennett to win the green jersey of the Tour de France, I'm going to be completely upfront with you, uh, because I expected Pete Stegan to do so. But he's developed as one of the fastest sprinters, if not the fastest one. He's left Bora uh, because he couldn't compete on the uh, the Tour de France. And he's shown once again that De Conanc always has that one massive sprinter in their rank. It used to be Mark Evenich, then it became Marcel Kettel, then it was Sam Bennett, uh, in the meantime, you had Elia Viviane, you also had Fernando Gaviria. They always have that one guy that's so quick, he can win on many terrain, and he even come, can sometimes go over some hills, not all the time. Um, but very decent 2020 season for Sam Bennett, who will make, I believe, his um, debut this year in a couple of days on the UA Tour, and will aim to um, well, do the back-to-back on the Tour de France. It'll be tough, I think, for him to get the back-to-back on the points jersey. Um, but already very nice performance from uh, the uh, the Irishman, I think, last year. Certainly was. Do I see Sam Bennett winning the green jersey again this season? I'll have to say no, to be honest. I think Wout van Aert will be allowed to go for it. Van der Poel will be at the Tour de France this season. I'm sure he'll be after that, perhaps, depending on the situation with the Olympics, which I think Van der Poel um, is aiming for as well. Peter Sagan too. I just think Sam Bennett... I don't think he'll be able to win the green jersey again this season. That's that's my take on that. But I think we'll expect to see him win at least another stage at the Tour de France. And he's won a stage at every Grand Tour now in his career. He's had quite the career, to be fair, winning, I think, a total of eight Grand Tour stages. So Sam Bennett really is one of the best sprinters in the world right now, probably in the best team to be in for a sprinter, I would say, because Viviani, Gaviria, when they're riding for quick step, they're winning almost every single race it seems so he's here and uh yeah one of the best sprinters in the world for sure i remember him saying at the pre-season training camp he fancied going for milano san remo which is on his schedule i'm not sure if he'll be able to 
Um, what do you think? You said he can rise some hills. Is that something you see within Sam Bennett's capabilities? I think you cannot underestimate Sam Bennett. Um, and I think it was like on the first stage of the Tour de France between Nice and Nice, uh, which granted had um, well a, a very low rhythm towards the end. I think he finished fourth. I think he also like got a podium on the third stage which had quite a lot of elevation, if I remember correctly, at the very beginning. So he is someone that can go over the hills. However, I don't know how he could perform uh, if the hills are paced at a very high rhythm. For example, the um, the Poggio or even La Cipressa. I think his best result on Milan Sarmo is a top 25, or actually a top 30. It might be a top 30 in 2019. Um, so it'll be interesting, especially knowing that he's in a team where Julien Lafilippe aims to also win Milano San Remo and Milano San Remo isn't always won by a sprinter um, I think the last couple of years it's always a little bunch uh, with fast riders but not all the time a main sprinter the, the last sprinter that won it probably is Arnaud Demar if I'm correct um, so it's going to be interesting he can win it but that's uh, that only depends on how the race is being ridden and with the the um, the likes of Gilbert wanting to win it, probably Van Aert uh, wanting to go for the back-to-back. I don't know if Van der Poel is doing it. He might be. If he does, I'm pretty certain all of these riders won't be aiming for a mass sprint, and that could uh, be a detriment to um, to uh, Sam Bennett. For sure. And, and Peter Sagan as well. I doubt he'll want the pure sprinters, the likes of Caleb Ewan and Sam Bennett there with him at the finish too. Of course, he's looking to win that race for the first time. And looking at the quick step team, I think Alaphilippe, We'll be riding Milano San Remo. We know uh, the tactic won't be to try and hold off for a sprint if he's there. And also a rider I think could do well at Milano San Remo is a rider we've seen a little bit of so far this season, Davide Ballerini. He won two stages at the Tour de la Provence and there he did prove he can go uphill um, and can still sprint very quickly. He can win mass sprints beating Arnold Demar. Um, in France so for me I think Quickstep probably have two better options than Bennett um, within their own team for Milan San Remo Um, so yeah I'm not sure it's within his grasp this season. Moving on to uh, a territory that isn't the the sprint or the one day classic although you never know with this man Remco Evenepoel I say this as he's one of the Classica San Sebastian so it kind of like defies my point He's 21 years old. I think his birthday was like a few weeks ago now. I have no idea how to classify this man. Uh, I want to see him on the Grand Tour this year. I know he's doing the Giro. He will be entering the Giro, I think, as De Konang's leader. I have so many questions around this 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 wonder kid. Uh, because, I mean, bef- I mean, I'm going to guess everyone knows it, but before doing cycling, he was, I believe in the um, youth ranks of Anderlecht, which was the which is a very um, successful football team in Belgium. I think he's also very good um, runner or like marathon rider. And he entered the sport, I think, in 2019, showing that uh, he could win quite a couple of things. Uh, he was second, I think, of the World Championship Stam Trial. Uh, he won La Ciclesa Sebastian. He won the Tour of Belgium. He's won San Juan, uh, he's won Volta Valgarve, he's won Burgos, he's won Tour of Poland. Last year, he competed in four stage races, he's won all four of them, and his season took uh, an abrupt end uh, after a collision with a bridge on Lombardia that sent him, um, well, quite far down, um, in a, a bit of a ditch, and his season ended on the 15th of August, when he was meant to be uh, partaking in the Giro. A Giro that was then won by Togenot and Jai Henley, it would have been very interesting to see how Remco would have performed um, on, a, on on that Giro. It's really hard to classify Remco this year. I don't know exactly what to expect from him, except that I can expect everything. I can't remember seeing a talent like this in cycling, to be honest. I mean, he had his Neo Pro season in 2019, and like you said, 2020... Four stage races, four overall victories, and he was going up against strong riders here as well. His victory in particular at the Tour of Poland stood out for me massively. Stage four, a hilly stage, um, and he won by almost two minutes solo ahead of Jakob Fulsang, um, more than two minutes ahead of Simon Yates and Raffle Micah, 
and then three minutes ahead of everyone else, including Maxi Shackman, Wilco Kelderman. Just an unreal performance. And he did it at every single stage race he entered last season. Until, of course, his, his season was ended in Italy at Il Lombardia. And what a shame it was we weren't able to see him at the Giro d'Italia. He's aiming to go back this year and we'll see. I mean, he's been off the bike for a little while. And at the time of recording this, we're in mid-February. He's just, I think, got back on the bike training. So it's hard to it's hard to know what to expect from Remco this season up until the Giro. It's hard to know when he'll be back racing how how far ahead of the Giro he can get back into competition because he's going to need some some warm-up races, you'd expect. So I hope he can get back into racing in the next month month or so. But if he can get back to his level, he was that pre-injury. Remco Venable, there's nothing he can't win. He can, he can win the Giro this year for sure. And then he'll be a favourite for pretty much every stage race he enters. The man is just unbelievable. You've mentioned uh, that you can't remember a rider that was so um, talented. Can you remember a rider that has so much hype around him? Because I certainly cannot. Not of this age. I mean, like you said, he's just just turned 21. I mean, it seems like he's been around a little while already after skipping the under-23 ranks. I, I, I genuinely cannot. There's so much hype surrounding... Remco Venepool and it's for good reason as well it's because on the bike he is just unbelievable even looking at riders like Egan Bernal Tadej Pogaccia we've seen what they're able to do winning the Tour de France in their early 20s when they were when they were at Remco stage of his career that he's at now there was nowhere near the same hype around those guys so yeah I mean I don't know what he can accomplish this year I just hope he can get back to his uh his pre Il Lombardia level it's yeah, I agree. He's only got the Giro right now, as you've mentioned on his calendar. I think we couldn't probably expect him to see him uh, making a first few, um, or well, his f- first appearance probably like on the tour of the Alps, maybe a bit before if his legs allow him to do so. Um, then probably Romandie and the Giro. It has to be mentioned, obviously, that it's quite hard planning a season ahead uh, in the current um, the coronavirus. So I think it could be a detriment to him. He said before he doesn't want to ride the Tour de France before riding a Giro or a Vuelta. That's intriguing to me because this year, the Tour de France, it suits him more on paper. It's got more time trialling. He is an unbelievable ti- time trialist. One of one of the best in the world, for sure. I think he came second in the 2019 World Championship time trial. And it would give him more time to get back to his top level. So... I mean, he's going for the Giro, which has the likes of Egan Bernal, Thibaut Pino, and many more entering this year. It's a strong start list, which Remco only adds to. But I think on paper, the Tour probably would have suited him more. But but we'll see. I mean, he's probably going to win the Giro. If he can get back to his level, he'll, he'll win it, I'm sure. Um, he is that good. Now, I would tend to agree on the, the first part of your statement um, regarding that the, the Tour de France suits him more. I think... Going on, he's a rider that likes to prove himself, to prove himself, uh, because he has so much hype around him that you usually want to perform well and prove that the hype isn't just because you're 21 and because you're an absolute monster and because you beat Ghana by nearly a minute in 2019 on the World Championships. Um, but I think going on the Giro will allow him to prove himself on the purely mountain uh, Grand Tours, and if he does well, then I think the hype will become real and be like, okay. We've backed him. We've backed this man for like two seasons now, but he definitely is the the real deal. And then, I mean, you never know if he could like even if he does like Giro Tour de France uh, as a double, he could win the tour uh, on his first potentially Tour de France participation if he does well on the Giro and if he has the legs. And that's scary. You're saying this year. You're saying this year he can win the Tour de France. I, I am indeed saying this here, although I know that doing the, the double Giro Tour de France isn't something that's really been viable over the past few years, but, I mean, yeah, the parkour seems him a lot. There's a lot of time trial. He's an absolute monster when it comes to the time trial efforts. Uh, yeah, and, I mean, even if, if you've got, like, Julien working for Remco, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, sadly, I don't think we'll see him at the Tour this year, but, yeah, in... Um, if he did ride it, it would be unreal and he'd have a great chance of winning, I'm sure, if he was in form. I mean, looking back to his Volta Algarve last year, 
there was a punchy hilly stage finish where he he out sprinted outlasted Matt Shackman Dan Martin Tim Wellens these guys are, are pure punchers really who are the best in the world at finishing on quick uphill finishes so if he's winning stages like that as well as longer climbs long solos time trials oh what what a talent this man is he he's unbelievable yeah I remember that finish vividly actually because I was very uh, skeptical about um about Remco but yeah I think like he just launched his sprint very early on and like they tried to follow him but they just couldn't and I also remember I think it was on Vuelta a Burgos where he managed to win uh, against a bit more of a, of a climbing um territory beating the likes of I think Mikel Landa um I think Joel Almeida lost like 45 to a minute that day uh, and he would then go on to be the Maria Rosa of the Giro for quite a while, uh, which proved the form the man was on. I think he dropped like Yates by a minute and a half. He's performed on so many different terrains that this man could win everything when it, or except sprints. Um, so I don't have him as my Giro winner. I think we've we've already given uh, each our winner throughout the uh, the previews this year, um, but. That he, he can do so well. He can do so, so well. And it's extremely scary to think of the future of cycling when you've got Remco Evenepoel in the sport. Yeah, there has been, I think, some scepticism about whether he can ride in the high altitude mountains. I'm not sure we've seen that from him just yet. Looking at the Vuelta Burgos, he, like you said, he won on the uh, Picon Blanco ahead of Lander, George Bennett, Simon Yates um, and his teammate Joao Almeida. To me, that shows this man can ride the high mountains. I mean, sure, we'll see what he can do for the first time, I guess, at the Giro this year in the super high altitude mountains. But I, I can't see it being an issue for Remco. Really can't. I mean, you've mentioned the Picon Blanco, but he's won the Tour of San Juan, which is in Argentina. And I'm pretty sure like the stage finish of the Queen Sage is like around 3,000 meters, if I'm correct. Um, I don't think he won that stage, but he finished with the likes... Of, uh, I mean, I think Guillaume Martin was the only main guy, to be fair, on, on this race with Brandon McNulty. Um, but he definitely can perform uh, at high altitude. I, I'm, I'm sure of it. I think 2020 surprised us in many ways, but Joao Almeida was probably the main surprise of 2020. Some say Mark Hirschi, and I mean, I would understand. But in his first ever World Tour season, he did very well, I think, on, on Algarve. Then he did very well in Burgos, which would be won by Remco Venepoel. Uh, and and then this, the Giro was so weird for him. I mean, he always was there when, like, what in the finishes. I don't. I think his worst result is, like, outside of the top 30, or just one time out of the top 30, but I'm not sure about that. And he just performed day in, day out. I don't think... He did not. I mean, he clearly didn't have the legs to to go and win it um, after the uh, the Stelvio, but he showed that uh, De Canon could also count on him. They've got a lot of promising youngsters, and I think when you've got, I mean, we've mentioned Remco, but when you have Remco in your team, you may tend to overlook some of the other riders. And I think uh, you've mentioned there was a blessing in his guys, and I completely agree. Uh, it really helped putting Joao Almeida on the map uh, as a GC guy. He'll be leading La Vuelta. He'll be leading the UA Tour. Um, I, can he win the UA Tour? Yes. Will he win it? I mean, the start list is absolutely unreal. Uh, we might talk about the UA Tour in, um, in an upcoming podcast, but the start list is absolutely phenomenal. I wouldn't have Joao win it yet, especially as his, um, his return race. But he definitely is the one to watch. He's only 22. There's so many young riders right now that we've talked about in, in the podcast. Every time... I'm surprised by the age of the riders. Uh, and to think he's only one year older than me really makes me old as well. Um, but yeah, I think he's 2020 was a very, very crucial year for him. Um, I think 2021, he'll be mainly focused on getting his first ever stage win uh, because he's yet to do so. Uh, but I wouldn't wait much longer for Joao to um, open his, uh, his count. I, I am really high on this man, I must say. And if we had to give predictions on who we think could win Love Welter, I know we don't really know who will be there yet, but Joao Meza would be right at the top of my list right now. I think this man is so good. And 
the UAE Tour, we know it's a very strong start list. Pogacar is going to be desperate to win it for UAE Team Emirates, the home team. Adam Yates, we saw how good he was last year at the UAE Tour. He's going back for the, for the Ineos Grenadiers. But Joao Almeida, I think we'll I think we'll preview the UAE Tour in a later podcast. But Joao Almeida could definitely be a, a challenger for me. Oh, I think he he could. Uh, I mean, I was going to say he could fight for the white jersey, but then I remembered that I put, that Adepo Gacha was there. <laughs> so clearly he cannot. I mean, he can. Let's be honest, he can. Um, but yeah, I think he might be a, just a bit short um, for um, for the Tour. He hasn't competed since the Giro. Um, and I, I would tend to back maybe someone like Adam Yates a bit more. He's the one week, the, the one week race god. Um, but but I think it's a very good race um, to prepare for the upcoming deadlines for for Joao, which will be towards the end of the season. And why not? Why not have a Portuguese rider on the podium step of a Grand Tour? For sure, it could definitely happen. But I want to know where you see Joao Meza in this team because it seems he's been given leadership of La Vuelta. This man is a very good puncher for me who could lead in the Ardennes. He could lead other one-week one races, as it seems he will do at the UAE Tour. But this team obviously have Remco. They also have Julian Alaphilippe, who is the clear leader for them in the Ardennes. So do you think Almeida fits in this team? His contract does end this season. And I wonder if Quickstep are going to be able to do enough to retain him because he's going to be um, a very kind of hot prospect in the in the transfer window if he is available. I mean, I agree with you on the the sense that he is ma- uh, quite versatile and I don't think he'll have the leadership position on all the races where he could potentially be a leader. Um, but I think what weighs in the balance uh, in Duke Anang's favour is that we've seen year in, year out that Duke Anang is a team with a winning pedigree and they all, like, all of their riders usually perform well. For a 22-year-old Joel Almeida, first of all, to have his chance as a leader on a Grand Tour, I don't think many teams uh, fighting for usually GCs could offer him that. Um, so that's already a thing that in De Conang's favour. But they can do many things in order to make him win. Um, I mean, he will have a supporting cast somewhat strong. Uh, the likes of uh, James Noakes, Faust Thomas Nader. I mean, we don't know if they're going to do the Vuelta yet. But there's possibilities for him to have a decent lineup solely based around him. You'll have most likely one sprinter on the Vuelta as the Conanco always does. Uh, now, will he? Will they retain him? Um, I mean, I, I don't know, but I think it would be in Joe's best interest to re-sign with the Conanco. You've mentioned early on that they're a team that usually gives a very short-term contract, uh, usually one or two seasons. And I think they can give him like two more years, see how he does, and also for Joao to see if he enjoys being in that team. And when the times come, then yeah, he can most likely uh, take uh, take his talent to another team. But for now, I think it's the best fit for him. That's a really interesting take because for me, if I mean, there's not a team in World Tour that's not going to want Joao Almeida. I'm sure if I'm if I'm EF Pro Cycling, UAE, Trek Segafredo, any of those teams and more, um, and I see Joao Almeida available, I'm going all in to get him. And if, from Joao Almeida's point of view, those teams are saying, we'll pay you twice as much, we'll give you a three-year deal, and you can pick if you want to lead the Tour, lead the Giro, lead the Vuelta, you can lead the Ardennes, and give him basically full flexibility in his schedule, it's going to be difficult for him to turn down for me. I think it's a really interesting point and it's going to be difficult because Remco and Alaphilippe are clearly above Almeida in the pecking order and that, that's fair enough because they are two generational talents. But Gerard Almeida, it's an interesting one. I, I'm not sure we'll see him at the Koenig next season um, and it obviously depends how this season goes. We'll see. But... Um, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, question for me. So if you're Joel Almeida, right now, where do you go? Which team in World Tour do you go to have a leadership position on the Grand Tour? Okay, yeah. Uh, I, do, uh, I do tend to agree with Trek. Maybe not e- uh, not EF, I don't know. I think they've got like Uran Carthy and Higuita and I think Almeida fits in that bunch. Uh, so fighting for a clear leadership would be maybe a bit tough. But yeah, Trek, I do agree. Uh, but it's interesting. It's an interesting point of view. I maybe so the um I didn't really take the financial aspect in consideration when I was making my point. 
Um, but interesting. I'll, I'm quite curious to see what, what Joe does in uh, the upcoming season then. Now, the last uh, focal point on, um, on the Conan Quick Steps agenda is obviously their classic squad. They always have been a classic team winning Parobe with the likes of Tom Bonen, the likes of Nikita Abstra. Uh, and they, in my opinion, don't have the best couple rider in the world anymore, but they probably have one of the strongest teams, if not the strongest, with the likes of Florian Seneschal, the likes of Kasper Asgreen, the likes of Denek Chiba and uh, Yves Lampart. Um, I think those four riders are, are always threats when uh, it comes to, uh, to a couple classic. Kaspar Asgren, obviously, uh, second of the Ronde from Vlanderen. Seneschal, I think, got second of Gonvevel Game. Yves Lampart, uh, who's, I think, podiumed, I think he podiumed uh, Roubaix, if I'm correct, but I think he did. Um, and Jdenek Chibar, two times uh, runner-up of Roubaix. It's a very, very strong lineup uh, for the boys in blue. And um, once again, they'll attempt to win a monument. They haven't won one last year. I think that probably took a toll on them. Uh, so I'd be very, very careful uh, if I was the opposition uh, when it comes to uh, to the couple races because the Konank isn't here to uh, just show their jersey. Uh, certainly not. And the thing is, is that the Koenig always lights up these races because they have definitely the strongest team. No doubt about it. Any of the couple classics, they have the strongest team in terms of depth. Obviously, they don't have Wout van Aert, Matthew Van Der Poel, um, who are probably the two riders you'd want, especially Wout van Aert, in my opinion, um, in the couple classics. But if these guys make it a hard race, constantly sending Asgreen, Lampet, Stibar, Seneschal up the roads, riders who could feasibly win the race easily going solo, the other teams have to react and they'll burn through their domestiques and suddenly De Koenig have a numbers advantage and that's the point where they have to punish the likes of, of Wout van Aert and Matthew Van Der Poel and I think they're going to win a lot of couple classics. They do it every year um, and I think they'll do it again this year. I think of the of the four riders we've mentioned, for me, I see a big season for Yves Lampert this season. Florian Senschau as well perhaps but I think Yves Lampert probably... Like you said, he podiumed uh, Roubaix a few years ago. He's come close a few times. He won Drew Dagsa, Brug de Panna last season. I really feel Yves Lampert is due a big, big result. Um, and I see him doing very well in the, in, in the Cobble Classics this season. It's interesting because out of the four riders, the one I usually rate the least would be Yves Lampert. Uh, I would most likely back Kasper Asgren a bit more. Um, don't ask me why I, it's just I think maybe preference maybe I'm not the biggest fan of Yves Lampard um, but I think as I mean one of these four riders will win a couple classic that is for sure uh, unless someone else from the Konang just steps out of the bunch and decides to win that could also happen we've seen it uh, happen a couple of seasons ago um, but yeah overall when it will when we'll have a couple races you've mentioned that they have the strength in numbers they may not have the strongest one but they've got the numbers and um yeah i think their tactics is just to launch one rider wait until the opposition uh teammates are knackered to launch another attack to make the leaders work uh and eventually it should um it should lead to win it's i mean it's it's a, a simple rule technically um uh, but yeah, Dukunank on the cobbles. They didn't win, as I said last year. This year, they're winning. They certainly are. Omloop is coming up very shortly after uh, we release this podcast. I, I think it's 27th of February. Cannot wait for that, of course, Belgium's opening weekends. And you, you mentioned Askreen. His win at Kerner, Brussels Kerner, last season was unbelievable. His power in the final 20k to stay ahead of, of the chasing pack was unreal. So... I, I mentioned Lampert. I mean, any of the four could win a Cobble Classic. We know uh, Zdenek Stibar won Omloop a few years ago. Florian Seneschal, for me, is probably the rider who's probably achieved the least in his career so far. Um, but I do think he is a proper cobbled specialist. And, and for me, he looked brilliant last season. It was his best season for me by far, um, so far in his career. Second at Gamp Wevel Gem. He looked good at pretty much all the Cobble Classics in... October, strangely enough. Um, and yeah, another rider who could win um, plenty of these races. And of the four riders, I see Seneschal being the best sprinter 
um, of the four. So perhaps the best option for de Koenig if it does come down to a mass sprint. And we saw that at the Cusca de Almeria only a few days ago where he came second, only beaten by Giacomo Nizzolo. So we swing on to the final section of today's podcast where we preview a rider to watch each. A rider perhaps going under the radar, perhaps up up and coming as well, um, who we think could make a big impact this season. And for me, I will go for Andrea Baggioli. He's only 21 years old from Italy. I cannot believe he is just 21. I mean, we, we mentioned it before recording this podcast, Guillaume. Baggioli is a massive talent. He showed a lot last year. He won a stage of the Tour de Lan. I think he beats uh, Primoz Roglic in a uphill sprint there. He's a very strong puncher. I think he rode, I think I recall him riding for Davide Ballerini at the Italian National Championships where he did a just stellar job. Um, he's got some good results. He's won the Ronda de Lizar. Uh, he won the GC there, which comes as a surprise to me, beating the likes of Andreas Lettnesund and uh, Clement Champassan, two very talented riders in their own rights. But Baggioli is a, for me, he's a real puncher who does very, very well um, on the shorter hills. He also is a rider who can last some fairly lengthy climbs and also a rider who is pretty quick in a sprint. He achieved a podium finish, actually, on the stage 10 of La Vuelta last season. I mean, I could go on here because there are so many results he already has to his name at the age of just 21. I think he fits very well in the De Conang DNA. Um, he is very decent teammate. Uh, he can perform well on most of the terrain. Uh, but then when he has his opportunity to maybe go and win, he can take it. Uh, I think he got a podium on La, on La Vuelta last year. Uh, on this stage, be, I think behind Roglic, and I can't remember who got second um, on this stage. Uh, might have, I think it was a boy. It could have been Felix Rochard now, but do not count me on it. Um, and yeah, he got a top 20 on La Flèche Wallon. Um, I mean, he knows his strength, I think. He's 21, as you've mentioned. Uh, he has a lot of time to progress. Uh, and I could see Bajoli in the coming years. Uh, fixating on the Ardennes. I think that's already what he's doing this year, but I think he comes realistically as a teammate. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, in two, three years, maybe even less. I mean, that would be one year uh, in the current world of cycling. Uh, things go very quickly. You could see Bajoli maybe trying to um, to play for himself on one of these races. Uh, again, end of the contract this year for Bajoli. We've mentioned it with Joel Almeida. Um, so it will be um, interesting to see how the uh, 21-year-old performs. He's going to be riding the Ardennes, I believe, this year, probably just as a pure domestique, but he will make his first appearance at the Giro d'Italia, his home Grand Tour. He's going to win a stage, I'm telling you. Baggioli is going to win a stage of the Giro this season. Yeah, I'll back it. Uh, I-, I will back that. Moving on to uh, the rider I shall follow. Born on the 1st of June... A 1999, once again, this man is, he's two days older than me, Maori Van Sevenant, um, who made his World Tour debut last year uh, for De Conanc, I think post-lockdown uh, on the Tour de l'An. No main result uh, last season, he DNF'd on the Dauphiné, uh, and then, I mean, yeah, not the greatest of, um, of 2020s, but he kicked off 2021 by... Um, being a domestic on the um, on the Tour de la Provence, and he surprised a lot of riders, a lot of yeah, I mean yeah, a lot of riders, but also a lot of people that were watching. Get this man on the Vuelta team. I mean, he is a real talent, and like you said, his performance on Vontu was was massive. After Carlos Rodriguez, another massive talent for Ineos. After he pulled over. I mean, pretty much everyone was done at that limit and Van Sevenen came to the front and worked for Alaphilippe's super, super impressive rides. Now, before we wrap it up, uh, we have the usual uh, question. Joe, let me put you on the spot. How many wins does De Conanc, uh rack up in 2021? So they managed 39, 2020. Looking at 2019, quickly, uh, they managed 68 wins. That's kind of a normal calendar. I'm not sure the calendar we'll see this year. But I think I'll go with 75 wins. I'm going 
I'm going 75 wins. I mean, the riders they have developing right now, they're getting better every year. The likes of Bagioli, Almeida, Avenapool, uh, Van Savenen, like we mentioned, to go along with Philippe, the best Cobble Classic squad, and Sam Bennett's. I mean, they're going to win at least 75, 75 races. Okay. No, I mean, it, it's, it's... You sound seems, shocked. Maybe. I mean, I, I am. I'm absolute. I'm completely baffled, if that's what you want to know. Um, I think, like, the best, their best win total since, like, well, in the current decade is, like, 73. Um, and I think in a calendar that has quite a few race, uh, races sorry, postponed or cancelled, I think aiming for 75 is an absolute heresy. Uh, so I'll, I'll go for, like, a solid 55. I think it's, it's a, it's a decent number for them. Um, and yeah... I mean, I, th- I still think they'll finish first um, and they will make it, I think, 10 years in a row they've been the best team uh, or the team the most uh, successful in World Tour. So 65 is the point kind of in the middle. So I, I need above 65 to win. You need under 65. We're looking back at this at the end of the year for sure. And and don't forget, they've got two already. Ballerini's already won two races and at the UAE Tour, on loop, the race is coming up. They're not going to slow down. So um, watch out. They'll be, they'll be 75 before you know it. And in the comments, also let us know uh, if well, you think they're going to go above 65, below, or if you have a specific number in mind, let us know. But this is where we're going to wrap up this podcast. We do hope you've enjoyed it. We'll have another team preview, I think, before the UAE Tour. And um, yeah, Joe, do you have a prediction for us? Davide Ballerini to win Milano San Remo. I somehow expected you to say that, and I still think it's completely mad. Cheers, guys. Cheers.